Thank you very much, Madam Deputy Speaker. With the clothes on their backs, they came through a storm, and those that didn't die want a better life, and they want it here. I quote Madam Deputy Speaker eh, from the pilot episode of West Wing, which I have been re-watching recently for inspiration, and I have to admit, in these very strange and difficult times, comfort. They're the words of the poetic, indeed prophetic, eh, writer um, Aaron Sorkin by the President Josiah Bartlett in this series. And they sum up so well the plight and experience of so many refugees which we have heard about in spades today. Because before COVID-19 was upon us, the plight of refugees across the world was of epic and catastrophic proportions. What they are now experience, as we have he experiencing, as we have heard, has only exacerbated that horrific situation. So I warmly congratulate and pay tribute to the Honourable Lady for Bethnal Green on and, Bo and Bo for securing this debate and on such a fantastic and passionate speech, because it's vital that we shine a light on the experiences of refugees and asylum seekers now and always. Because I have a fear uh, that as amongst the media saturation of what is happening domestically with COVID-19, we lose sight of the plight of those. And I think often of the book An Extremist by Lindsay Hilsom, which was about the life of Marie Colvin, who was, of course, killed in homes in Syria. What the Honourable Lady from Bethnal Green and Bow talked about was bearing witness that she had gone to Burma, that she had gone to Syria, as members of this place should, and journalists should, to bear witness to the experiences and report back and come home to do what we can to make their lives better. And I think we can all imagine the restrictions that are now upon journalists travelling means that the quality and the stories eh, and experiences of those who are at the forefront of the refugee crisis and indeed the COVID-19 crisis, eh, we are not hearing those experiences eh, as we would like to. So I pay tribute to all members who have spoken eh, today I think uh, I would first like to just share uh, some uh, reflections from my own childhood. I grew up uh, in, in Livingston and West Lothian, and my mother had a friend who was Chilean. And he had, he had left Chile, he had uh, escaped Chile and the Pinochet regime on the underside of a lorry with literally the clothes on his back because his name had been added to a list of those targeted to disappear. So my early experiences as a, a child was of hearing those stories and hearing those experiences. But they are, I would imagine, eh, very, very different eh, to the, the level that we have heard today of the experiences of eh, asylum seekers and refugees who are not only having to fight for their lives, but fight for their health. And as the Honourable Lady for Bethnal Green and Bow said, we are an interconnected and global village. She spoke of the hith history of refugees coming to the UK and what they have brought and how they have enriched our society. She spoke of the Rohingya refugees and the way that the Myanmar government and military have treated those. And I absolutely echo the concerns that she raises in that regard. Um, the Honourable Member for INFI pronounced this wrongly, Devises. <laughs> it was a good go. Um, spoke about how I, I may not have agreed with him on everything that he spoke about, but he, but he did speak about how we are all global citizens. The honourable member for Slough um, said, "We know that COVID doesn't respect borders, uh, but urgent supplies are needed, and the FCDO response isn't enough." And also referenced the merging of DFID and the FCO, which is a major error. Uh, and I think that many of us have raised concerns and would agree with that. And the Honourable Member for Ryslip, Northwood and Pinner spoke of the responsibility uh, that local authorities feel and the resource that is needed. Uh, I may again not have agreed with everything he said, but he made a very fair point. And we have heard about the £1 billion of UK pledged to respond to COVID-19 that includes support specifically targeted at forcibly displaced populations. Uh, but, you know, put, throwing, not throwing, but, but donating money uh, to the situation is, of course, admirable. But as we have heard time and time again, the UK is not taking its fair number and not doing its bit in that regard. And the member for Bradford West 
summed that up when she said that the UK doesn't even come in the top 10 of countries that accepts refugees. Um, she also spoke about the uh, insidious and discriminatory immigration policies, the Ascension Islands uh, and, and uh, the concerns about the language being used by those in the UK government around activist lawyers. We are in a very dangerous place uh, as a family of nations in the UK when the government of the day uh, in the UK t talks about those who uphold the rule of law and who fight for those who are marginalised as activist lawyers rather than those who are trained and are trying to do their best to hold this government to account and make sure that the rule of law is adhered to. So I would caution the government and I would ask uh, the minister to set the record straight on that. Um, the, the, the Honourable Member for Strangford talked about the vaccine and the concerns that he had about that. And I, I share his concerns. I, I have a company in my constituency, um, uh, Valneva, who, are, who have received uh, UK government funding, which I advocated for strongly. And I ve was very pleased to hear that the UK government was not going to put all its eggs in one basket. Um, and this is something that you know, I discussed with, with them when they were awarded that funding, and they hope uh, and are making huge progress. Um, but refugees are some of the most vulnerable, if not the most vulnerable people in the world. Um, and uh, you know, we have to make sure that they are at the forefront of getting uh, those vaccinations. Of course, everybody uh, will, will need to get one and, and, and they will be prioritised appropriately. But it does concern me, and I know the Honourable Member for Strangford, that um, you know, those people who are most hard to reach uh, and most vulnerable um, will, will potentially be at the end of, of the queue. And, and I was struck as well by what the Honourable Lady for Canterbury said, um, because I had a line in my, in my own speech about the experience of refugees and the experience of asylum seekers, that we in this country have a whole host of programmes where very privileged folk are put through their paces in survival skills, whether it's I'm a celebrity, get me out of here, and I, you know, I, I mean no ill will to the programme, uh, or indeed those, in, those endeavours, but there is something quite I, I, I don't know what the words are, but it does not sit well with me uh, that we are, we are making those kinds of programmes when you know, refugees are, are, are literally fighting for their lives uh, to get across the world. Because, Madam Deputy Speaker, it was Gandhi, was it not, who said the measure of a civilisation is how it treats its weakest members. Yeah. But refugees and asylum seekers are not weak. Arguably, they are some of the most tenacious, resilient, stoic folk on the planet. And I think there is an irony around that, that these TV programmes are made. Now, it wouldn't be a surprise to Scots that our First Minister Nicola Sturgeon said the UK Government can rest assured that any proposal to treat human beings like cattle in a holding pen will be met with the strongest possible opposition from me. And that was in reference to the Home Secretary admitting to exploring plans to incarcerate refugees on an island off the west coast of Scotland while they were being, and I quote, processed. The inhumane language that is used by this Government is an absolute international disgrace. Now, I don't know about anybody else, but when this government's policies start looking and sounding like a dystopian TV series that I think many of us have watched, then we have huge problems. And in Scotland, Madam Deputy Speaker, um, we have, uh, we have uh, pursued um, a, a, a programme called the, the Guardianship Scheme, which one of my, uh, my MSP colleague uh, Angela Constance has spoken about passionately and, and had a debate on uh, just last week. For the past 10 years, Scotland has proudly run the Guardianship Service in conjunction with the Scottish Refugee Council and the Aberlour Child Care Trust. In those 10 years, 700 children from 38 countries speaking 40 different languages have been supported to rebuild their lives in Scotland across 29 local authority areas, the length and breadth of Scotland. And I think it was the member for Bradford East who talked about the contribution, as did others, that refugees make. And I mentioned the, uh, I, in closing, Madam Deputy Speaker, I just wanted to highlight the scheme that we have uh, developed in Scotland, which means that refugees can come and work in our NHS uh, and, and are literally at the forefront. So we must remember, as, as another member said, we are all human beings, and refugees and asylum seekers have faced some of the worst conditions, but many have skills 
and want to come here and contribute. And that this government stops them from doing that is a shambles and shames us all. So I call on this UK government to put fairness and decency and humanity at the heart of its immigration policy, because at present it stands as an international disgrace. Shadow Secretary of State, Preet Kargil. Thank you, Madam 